going to read four brief passages from the book of Acts. <clears throat> we haven't time to read all the context in each case, so I'll just have to explain each one as we come to it. The book of Acts, chapter 2, first of all, the story of the first day of Pentecost, and just an account of what happened at 9 o'clock in the morning. Seven weeks had now gone by since Jesus' death and resurrection, and the day of Pentecost arrived. As the believers met together that day, suddenly there was a sound like a roaring of a mighty windstorm in the skies above them, and it filled the house where they were meeting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on their heads. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in languages they did not know, for the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. We turn over the pages to another city, the city of Samaria. And here we have a group of people who were half Jews and half Gentiles. And Philip came preaching to them. Verse 5 of chapter 8. Philip went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about Christ. Crowds listened intently to what he had to say because of the miracles he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. A man named Simon had formerly been a sorcerer there for many years. He was a very influential, proud man because of the amazing things he could do. In fact, the Samaritan people often spoke of him as the Messiah. But now they believed Philip's message that Jesus was the Messiah and his words concerning the kingdom of God. And many men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself believed and was baptized and began following Philip wherever he went and was amazed by the miracles he did. When the apostles back in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent down Peter and John. And as soon as they arrived, they began praying for these new Christians to receive the Holy Spirit for as yet he had not come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now we turn to Acts 10. We're moving yet further away from Jews. We're now moving into a Gentile house with no Jewish blood in it, a house that the Jew Peter was reluctant to go to until God made it quite clear that he had to. And he went into the house and the regimental sergeant major of the Roman army who lived in that house said to Peter, I sent for you and you have done well to come so soon. Now here we are waiting before the Lord, anxious to hear what he has told you to tell us. And now chapter 10 verse 34, Peter begins to preach. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that the Jews are not God's only favorites. In every nation he has those who worship him and do good deeds and are acceptable to him. I'm sure you've heard the good news for the people of Israel that there is peace with God through Jesus the Messiah who is Lord of all creation. This message has spread through all Judea, beginning with John the Baptist in Galilee. And you no doubt know that Jesus of Nazareth was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went around doing good and healing all who were possessed by demons, for God was with him. And we apostles are witnesses of all he did throughout Israel and in Jerusalem, where he was murdered on a cross. But God brought him back to life again three days later. 
and showed him to certain witnesses God had selected beforehand, not to the general public, but to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he sent us to preach the good news everywhere and to testify that Jesus is ordained of God to be the judge of all living and dead. And all the prophets have written about him, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening. The Jews who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit would be given to Gentiles too. But there could be no doubt about it. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Peter asked, Can anyone object to my baptizing them, now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? So he did, baptizing them in the name of Jesus, the Messiah. Now we'll turn over yet again and read one more story, Acts 19. Acts 19, the first few verses. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through Turkey and arrived in Ephesus, where he found several disciples. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied. We don't know what you mean. What is the Holy Spirit? Then what beliefs did you acknowledge at your baptism? He asked, and they replied what John the Baptist taught. Then Paul pointed out to them that John's baptism was to demonstrate a desire to turn from sin to God, and that those who received his baptism must then go on to believe in Jesus, the one John said would come later. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then. When Paul had laid his hands upon their heads, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other languages and prophesied. The men involved were about twelve in number. There are four stories from the New Testament whose meaning and implication seems to me as clear as daylight, but we are very, very reluctant to face up to that meaning. I'm going to talk about that this morning. I'm going to preach from a text this morning, which I don't usually do, but I'm going to go through that text to a theme that runs through the New Testament. And here it is from 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. By this we know that he abides in, we abide in him and he abides in us because he has given us of his own spirit. By this we know, because he has given us of his own spirit. Now there's a little chorus that we used to sing in Sunday school that goes something like this, joy, 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 with joy my heart is ringing, joy, 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 his love to me is known, my sins are all forgiven, I'm on my way to heaven, my heart is bubbling over with his joy, joy, joy. Uh, how many of you have sung that before? Let's see, right, familiar. Now, to many people, that's the most offensive chorus. To some, it would appear near blasphemy, especially the confidence of the third line. My sins are all forgiven, I'm on my way to heaven. To the unbeliever, that certainly sounds like utter conceit, as if you're singing, I'm God's favorite, I am. I'm okay, I am. I'm safe, I am. Doesn't matter about the rest of you. I'm on my way to heaven. But to many sincere churchgoers, it seems terrible presumption. It seems much more humble and much more fitting to say, well, we must all try our best and wait for the judgment day for the result. But to start singing, I'm on my way to heaven, joy, 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 my heart is bubbling over, seems altogether unwarranted confidence. Yet such a confidence runs right through the pages of the New Testament. There is a certainty there which leaves persons in no doubt that they are on their way to heaven. This is how all the early Christians talked. They don't begin to get up in a pulpit and say, may I venture my opinion 
or I suggest to you for your consideration, they get up and say, we are on our way. We know, we are sure. And if you take the New Testament and underline the word no, we know, we know, you'll be astonished at their confidence. Now, how did they get it? Where did they get this boldness, this optimism, this absolute certainty that they belong to God, not only for time, but for eternity? Some would say that the basis for Christian assurance is the scripture. That you can be sure you're a Christian because it's written in the book. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that assurance is based on your claiming the written word of God. That he says whoever repents and believes has everlasting life. Therefore you claim that promise and your certainty is based on his word. Now that is certainly part of your assurance. Any confidence you feel must be based on what God has said. But it is not enough to give you absolute certainty. For the simple reason that it's too objective. It's too outside yourself. It says there that whoever believes is certain of heaven. But how do I know that I am included? It says there whoever's na whose ever name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life will go to, to heaven. But how do I know that my name is written there? It says there that if someone repents and believes that they are a Christian, but how do I know if I've repented enough? Now, if it's said somewhere in this book, David Pawson is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and is going to heaven, that would be an absolute certainty if God had said that in the Bible, but he didn't say that in the Bible. All he said was, whoever repents and believes is written. So that leaves me with some uncertainty and it can lead to a nagging doubt. Did I really believe enough? Have I really repented enough? Am I really written in that book in glory so that I'm sure of going there? If your certainty is based on the Bible alone, it will be subject to doubt. And from time to time that certainty will be shaken. And you will wonder whether you are actually written in to these promises. Then there are those who say that coupled with the scripture, your certainty must be based on your own sanctity or holiness. And once again, this is an element of the truth. We're told that we know that we are Christians because our conscience bears witness to us that we are living a Christ-like life in the world. But then who is? And if my assurance is based on my living a Christ-like life in this world, then frankly I am going to be beset by nagging doubt again. Because there are times when I know I have not lived a Christ-like life. There are times when I know I have sinned and the devil uses that sin to shake my certainty and says, are you sure? A Christian wouldn't have done that sort of thing. A Christian wouldn't have said that or felt that and you feel the doubt coming again. You see, the, the trouble with this ground of assurance, my sanctity, is that that's too subjective a ground. How do I know if I'm holy enough? How do I know that I'm not entertaining too high a view of myself? Or what is equally common among Christians, too low a view of myself? Because I'm the worst person in the world to judge me. And you're the second worst person in the wor world to judge me. And this element of doubt comes in. Where then did these people in the New Testament get their certainty from? Did they get it from the New Testament? No, because they didn't have a New Testament. It hadn't been written yet. Did they get it from their sanctity, that they had become such saints that their own manner of life convinced them they were Christians? No, because when you read the story, they were not that holy yet. They still made mistakes. Why then were they so sure? Every study of the New Testament points to the fact that whereas Scripture gives you some certainty and your own growth in grace and change of behavior and attitudes gives you another element of certainty, 
The thing that clinches it every time is neither the scripture nor your sanctity, but the spirit. This is where the certainty came. The confidence of the early Christians was due to the fact that they had had an unusual encounter with the Holy Spirit of God. Now Christianity is through and through Trinitarian. Let me say a few things that I'm saying on the radio Wednesday morning. Let's start right at the beginning with utterly simple things. There is only one real God. We all know that. Every Jew was brought up to believe that. There is only one God, and to those of us who have not lived in a polytheistic society with gods at every street corner, we don't know what relief it is to be told there's only one person up there. And yet, when Jesus came to the Jews, this faith of theirs in one God received a big jolt because he claimed to be the Son of God. And they had to begin to think of God as identical twins and even closer than identical twins, so close that to talk to one felt just like talking to the other. To talk to the Son was to talk to the Father. To meet the Son was to meet the Father. And yet they talked to each other. So they had to begin to think of God as one God and yet somehow two persons. That's as far as many Christians have got. They believe in God, they believe also in Jesus. And that's as far as they've got. But then a further complication came when Jesus said, I'm going to go back to my Father and yet a third divine person is going to come and take over where I leave off. And you'll need to get to know yet a third person. So that now we have to think of God as triplets, identical triplets, so identical, so close that even the word triplet gets left behind and Christians have had to coin a new word for something quite unique, someone quite unique, the word Trinity, which is simply the word triplet taken a stage further. And it is this lack of knowledge of the third person that has led to the uncertainty in which so many Christians find themselves. So that if you ask them, are you sure that all your sins are forgiven? Are you sure that you're going to heaven? Are you sure that if you died tomorrow or even today, you're perfectly safe and everything's going to be all right? Are you sure of this 100%? Well, I, I really hope so. Yes, I really try to be as sure as that. No, the New Testament would have said yes. With joy my heart is ringing, my sins are all forgiven, my, I'm on my way to heaven and my heart is bubbling over with the joy, joy, joy. That's the New Testament authentic ringing certainty and it comes from an acquaintance with the third person of the Trinity. Someone has said that Roman Catholics are sometimes guilty of worshipping a Trinity of Father, Son and Virgin Mary as the three persons most prominent in their conscious devotion. If that is true, and I don't know whether it is or not, maybe with some, I think Protestants are also in danger of worshipping a trinity of Father, Son and Holy Scripture, so that the Bible is more real to them than the person of the blessed Holy Ghost himself. I want to speak about three things this morning. The seal of the Spirit, the witness of the Spirit, and the earnest of the Spirit. Three phrases which I cull from this book. First of all, let me give you three texts in which this phrase seal is used. 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, He has put his seal upon us and given us his Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. A guarantee, that's a strong word. A guarantee. And then Ephesians 1.13, Having believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, seals were used very much more in the ancient world than today, before computers were invented, before there was widespread literacy and people could read and write. If you couldn't read or write, there was one way 
of making your mark, your seal. And seals were very common, everybody had them. Even until last century, most people had a signet ring, a little seal that they could use saying, that's my mark. And since that ring is on my finger, nobody else can use it, that's my mark. And anything I have stamped with my ring, that's mine. The seal was used for four purposes, security, to seal a door, or a book, or a tomb. It was used for truth, to attest the truth of a will or a contract, you put your seal at the bottom. Or it was used to guarantee quality, the seal on a sack of corn, and you've seen the good housekeeping seal and other seals today to guarantee quality. But the most common use of a seal was ownership. If you had a piece of property and you were having to leave it in a public place, you would seal it so that everybody looking at that property would say, that belongs to so-and-so. And it is this last meaning that Paul is clearly thinking about here. How does anybody know that you are God's property? God seals. He stamps you unmistakably. He seals you in some way. Now, how does he seal you? The answer is with the Holy Ghost. That is his seal on his property. Nobody else in the whole world can receive the Holy Spirit, only his people. Jesus said, whom the world cannot receive. The person who's not a Christian doesn't know a thing about the Holy Ghost and never will. That's why it's always difficult to preach on Whit Sunday because there are always those in the congregation who don't know Christ. And if you don't, I must seem as if I'm talking through my hat this morning. Only the believer can receive the seal of God, mine. Now, what is Paul referring to when he says the seal being the Holy Spirit of God? He's not referring to our salvation. He's not referring to our conversion because he makes it quite clear that our salvation comes when we put our name on the contract and believe in the Lord Jesus. He then says, after you have believed in him, then God puts his seal on you. You put your trust in God first. Your salvation comes by faith. You don't have the seal at that point. You have to exercise faith. There is no guarantee, no proof that it's going to work. By faith, you put your hand in God's hand and your salvation is secure. But then, after you believed in him, God stamps and seals with the Holy Ghost. And there is always this gap. It may be a very short gap, it may be a longer gap, but the New Testament distinguishes. In the case of the Samaritans of whom we read, it was quite a long gap. They believed in the Lord Jesus, they were baptized, in water, they had joy in believing, things were happening in Samaria, but as yet, no seal, no pouring out, no overwhelming experience of being filled with the Holy Ghost. They had their salvation, but it was not yet sealed. So Paul is not talking about salvation, nor is he talking about sanctification, the process of becoming holy, because he was writing to the Corinthians who were getting drunk at Holy Communion, Corinthians who were allowing incest within the church, Corinthians who were all divided into cliques and arguing with one another, and Corinthians who were proud, and he says, you were sealed. So he's certainly not thinking of a holiness. There's something else. What is it? What is this seal? Because whenever Paul uses the word seal, he uses a particular tense which means something that happened once. Not a continuous condition, but an event. An experience that was definite and divine. Something that left them in no doubt whatsoever that God had sealed what they had claimed through faith. Let me quote two scholars now. First of all, Dr. William Barclay, whose commentaries on the Bible many of you use in your devotions, and on the whole they are very helpful. Some points I think most of us would want to have a little debate with him, but that goes for every commentary that you ever read. But this is what Dr. Barclay says, and with only one word in the sentence would I want to discuss with him. In the early church, converts nearly always received the Holy Spirit 
in a perfectly visible and manifest way. The early chapters of Acts show that happening again and again. There came to them a new surge of life and power that anyone could see. The only word I'd want to cross out of that sentence is the word nearly. Because in fact it is true to say the early converts always received the Holy Spirit in a perfectly visible and manifest way so that Peter could say this which you see and hear. God sealed obviously. And the other scholar was a former vicar of Chalfant St. Peter whose books now sell by the tens of thousands all around the world, a man called Roland Allen, who wrote the classic book on missionary work, Missionary Methods, St. Paul's or ours. And he said this, Later, after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was given to many others. But always this peculiar definiteness marked the coming of the gift. There was always a time and a place at which each convert received the gift. In this the gift of the Holy Spirit to all later disciples partook of the same character as the first gift on the day of Pentecost. And that also is an accurate summary. It is because we have encouraged people to think of vague and general experiences rather than a time and a place and a definite receiving that we lack the certainty and the confidence of the early church. We have left people with vagueness rather than said there is a definite gift which when it is received will be known without doubt by you and everyone else present. This which you see and hear now, what exactly was the experience? It's quite clear that on the day of Pentecost, when this certainty first came, that the heart of it was not the wind and not the fire. Those were both symbols of the Holy Spirit getting nearer to them. The first symbol was the wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, so God was getting near them, inside the house, as it were, they were enveloped in this wind and God had taken a step out of heaven. God the Holy Spirit was now in the room. That was near. The next symbol brings the Holy Spirit even nearer to them. The sound of the wind above their heads was one step. The next step is flames that are touching them. That's nearer still. Flames are actually touching them now. But that's still not the crucial point. The crucial point is when the Holy Ghost got right inside them. The wind was up in the ceiling. The tongues were on their heads, but the Holy Ghost was right inside. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now it is that point that brought the certainty. Not the wind, not the fire, which never occurred again in all the records. But the certainty that came to later groups of Christians came in the same way as to them they were all filled and overflowed. And I've said this to you so often before, you must be getting sick of my saying it, that just as my bath at home has a little hole near the top underneath the taps for an overflow, God in his mercy has provided the same sort of thing for my body, right underneath my eyes and nose. And this is God's overflow. Every single time people are filled with the Spirit in the New Testament, it is the mouth that shows the immediate result. They were all filled and began to speak. It comes again and again. They spoke in different ways. Sometimes it simply says they were all filled with the Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. But it was here that it overflowed. They ceased to be silent saints. They were cured of lockjaw straight away. And the mouth opened. That is the overflow that we were given. I will tell you this, and I was talking to my wife about this not long ago. She said something quite simple. She said, before this happened to me, I used to have doubts from time to time as to whether I was a Christian. But now, I have known absolutely certainly that I'm a child of God. That is the certainty of the New Testament. It's not a boasting about anything we've done. It's just God seen. God witnessed. It's not whereby we think of God as Father, it's whereby we cry out, shout out, Father. It's a witness of the mouth. And finally, it is a foretaste, an earnest, 
Now this word earnest means a first installment. Now you know what that means. I don't need to explain that today. It's the first bit of more that's to come. It's the deposit. That's the best word. When this happens, you have a deposit of the future. Indeed, such an experience is bound to be a foretaste of heaven. It will lead to song. It will be a little taste of a life in which sin seems impossible. It will be a little taste of a life of worship, a life in which time means nothing. And I remember a dear housewife telling me that when she was filled with the Spirit all alone in her bedroom late one night, about 11 o'clock, she found that she praised God for four and a half hours and it seemed like 20 minutes. This is the earnest, the foretaste of glory. That's what heaven's going to be like. And once you've got the first installment, you say, I know the rest's coming. I'm on my way to heaven and my heart is bubbling over with the joy, joy, joy. Not only that, but the same spirit who's given you the foretaste and given you life before death, and I love that poster I saw outside a church. We believe in life before death, which is what Christians do believe. But the same spirit who gives you life before death also gives you life after death. For if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will also quicken your mortal body. I have a poem which I'm going to read. A poem written by a girl uh, in her twenties who was at the Birmingham Convention three weeks ago, a fortnight ago. And she's written to me a poem and said, I don't know what you'll think of it, but it just expresses what happened. For she came to this certainty through those meetings. And this is the poem. It's modern poetry, so don't look for rhyme or anything. But this is the poem. Father. How interesting. It begins with that. Father. Once I had a theology that fitted together. It was neat and tidy. Life had a meaning and purpose. I had a message for a needy world, but then I seemed to get into a whirlwind of ideas and theories. Somehow you didn't seem real anymore, and there didn't seem to be a message, and the problems of the world and of life seemed insoluble. You seemed to have died, and I was lost and alone in a world of fear and meaninglessness and despair. Father, I was wrong to let ideas and theories and problems take away your reality and love and purpose. Father, you've been so gracious and so gentle and so good. You've brought me back. You've loved me. You've forgiven me and made my body a temple of the Holy Spirit. And now I know I love you and trust you and belong exclusively to you. You're opening the eyes of my understanding. You're showing me the world as you see it. You're showing me your purpose, your wrath and your judgment, but also your mercy and your grace. You're showing me that the meaninglessness has a meaning, that the problems of the world have an answer. And you've blown away the fear and despair like clouds before the wind. Father, you've given me a message of love and grace and mercy. You've given me confidence in the message. It is the truth. It is reality. It is powerful. You've given me confidence as a messenger. I accept the command of Jesus as my authority and I receive the infilling, indwelling spirit of Jesus to constrain, compel, and enable. There's a note of authentic certainty in that little poem. There's the note of Father. There's the note of the wind blowing the clouds and cobwebs away. There's a note of confidence in the message and even, yes, she says, in the messenger now. I've got this confidence. May I on this Whit Sunday as your pastor plead with you in the name of Jesus not to panic about this, not to become neurotic about this, but rather to go and seek the certainty of such a pouring out of the Holy Spirit. It is the need of Christians today and praise God he's doing it today for more and more. And I want to add a special word to the men. 
It is easier for a woman to open her heart to this than for a man. But on the first day of Pentecost, men were there. And God desires to pour his spirit on men's servants as well as maid servants until young men dream dreams and old men see visions. And what we need so desperately are men who know what it is to have lived through Pentecost and to be living in it afterwards. Let us pray.